Welcome, trumpet player. Today I have an interview for you because I believe it's important to have conversations with other people so that we can get better on our trumpets sooner than later. And I like the guest that we have today because she has had a specific experience that has altered her perspective. Now, more specifically, she had a very serious injury and she just simply could not play trumpet the same way that she used to. And we're going to talk about those things. I think it's going to be a lot of great insights for you in this interview. And so today I have a great guest for you, someone who graduated from DePaul University, is a performer and an educator, someone who's performed with the Ides of March, Brass Band, Battle Creek, the Generationals, just to name a few. But she's best known as the Arlington Bugler. I'm happy to bring to you right now, Miss Monica Benson. Monica, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Let us know, let the viewer and the listener know about your accident. You had an accident and t really paint the picture for us. Like what happened right before and right after your accident that kept you from playing trumpet for, for a little time? Sure. Yeah, so back in 2015, I would say, uh, I think it happened in 2015. Yeah. So some friends and I were getting ready for a trip to the Grand Canyon and we were going to hike into the Grand Canyon. I'll go from one rim of the canyon to the other rim and then all the way back. So it was going to take, we were going to hike in, I think for three or four days and it's a pretty extensive hike. So we were doing a practice hike in a forest preserve in the suburbs of Chicago here. And it was in March. So I don't know, Mar Chicago in March can still be a little cold and winter, wintry. So there was snow on the ground, not a ton, um, but we were practicing for this hike. So we had our weighted backpacks on, like we had stuff in them to kind of mimic the weight that we would be carrying during our trip. Um, so I hit some ice, like my foot just, I don't know, like stepped on some ice and I fell. And because of the, my weight distribution was off, I just face planted hard right on my face. And it sounds kind of funny now, but it was not at the time. Um, so I cracked my front two teeth and there's a bone here right underneath your nose. I forget what it's called. So I just call it your mustache bone. Like whatever this bone is, I had fractured that. Um, so we had to go to an emergency dentist and um, he kind of cleaned things up as best as he could. And then a few days later, um, I was when I went and got an x-ray and they figured out that I had fractured this bone here. So it was just a long process, a lot of dental visits and I don't know, figuring out how you're going to put your face back together. And it took time because this bone was fractured. You couldn't really um, put any crowns or anything like on the bottom to make it look like you had teeth. So I just kind of looked like I got hit in the face with a hockey puck for like a week or so. Um, but yeah, and then eventually these what can happen with your roots of your teeth if there's like trauma that happens, it can cause the roots to die. So I had to get two root canals on my front two teeth and um, yeah, so I just overall wasn't a fun, fun process, I would say. So, Ouch. so that was the first iteration of that injury and it took me out mm, maybe like two or three months, I would say, it took me out of the game. Um, and I had just finished college, my undergrad the year before in 2014. So I was still kind of, I had just started working at Arlington. This was my second summer. So I had to take some time off of there. Yeah. Maybe I didn't have to take off as long as I, as I thought, cause I think I was back in June. So, so I have a question. How much pain were you in? Like immediately when it first happened, scale to one to 10. Yeah, I, it actually, it didn't hurt that bad, okay. which is really weird. Um, Cause like I had, and this is terrifying for any trumpet player. I was like sitting on the ground. I had broken teeth in my hand. Ooh. Like it was, yeah, it was horrible. But my only thought was, and this is kind of like the unhealthy thoughts I had around music back then. But my thought was, I have a gig later today. I had a church gig that same day. And I was like, oh my gosh, I have a gig today. And that was my only thought. Like it wasn't like the repercussions of what was going to happen or like the next 
how long the next few months were going to be. It was like, I have a gig. And it was the first gig that my, my college trumpet teacher had given me, had sent me. Mm. And I was like, oh my God. And so I was like upset because I was going to be letting him down and having to uh, like call and say like, hey, last minute, I can't come. Like this yeah. gig was probably in like three hours or something. Oh my goodness. So I'm sitting on the ground with my phone in my hand. My first call was to my trumpet teacher saying, I can't take this gig. Oh and my. yeah, you couldn't yeah. play though. So that was a <laughs> legit emergency and wow. So I'm sorry that happened. Just you telling the story, I can feel your pain in my heart, yeah. not the physical pain <laughs> in the chops, but oh my goodness. So what were what were some of your first steps to come back uh, when it happened? Sure. Um, so I I was in kind of a weird spot. I was set to, to I was supposed to go to um, Domaine Forge, which is this music festival um, up in Canada, and so I ended up going, but I, I couldn't really play that much. And I was kind of lucky to run into some people who, some teachers who had also gone through injuries. Um, there was a, a teacher there who she had gotten hit in the face with like a ski pole at one point. And then she had done a couple of dates with Canadian brass and she got hit in the face with a tuba when it like came up and it hit the bell of her trumpet into her face. So it was really kind of the right place at the right time to be because she helped me a lot. And because um, when you start to feel better, all you want to do is make up for the time that that you lost, you know, so you want to go hard and you really want to play. But that's pretty much the worst thing that you can do. So just like I had to do just like Clark studies for months and weeks is kind of all I did. And then I had this um, that same teacher gave me a book of duets and they were they're easy those uh verm duets i don't know if you've ever heard of those but they're pretty simple little duet book and she said play one line rest play the second trumpet line rest and then when you get tired stop and so it kind of was just a whole time and process of listening to your body but i don't feel like i understood the mechanics of the trumpet and how negative or not ne negatively but like how um not how unhealthily i was playing the instrument i guess until i had this most recent like iteration of this injury come back this past summer so, so. I, I got questions and i want to get to that but um initially when you first played the horn the first time you played the horn after the accident you said you had your teeth in your hand when you fell so were you mm -hmm. playing the instrument without your front teeth no, no, all that stuff was all that stuff was done prior to that. But and it wasn't like full, full teeth, you know, it was like uh. teeth chunks. Like if, if okay. I if you shine a light behind my front teeth, you see all these like micro fractures because okay. it just like shattered, you know. Yeah. So it. Yeah. So, so that's that's kind of what I had. Going on. How much time passed before you were able to play a note? Hmm probably a couple months. Okay. Yeah, cuz what they what they did was I they had to put a stabilizing bar across my front teeth for a while because they had to stabilize this bone here since it was fractured. And then I had to get a couple root canals and then um they had to like one my one my right tooth here was like cracked in half. So oh like the whole bottom half of the tooth like at an angle like this was kind of like just gone. So that was all built up at the time with like some kind of, it's not epoxy, that's not, they don't use that on your mouth, but it was some kind of dental stuff. It wasn't a full crown. It was just like some kind of stuff that they put to make it look like the bottom of the tooth was still intact. And how much so, time passed from the first surgery to the last surgery? In the grand scheme of things, yeah. Uh, my last surgery was, um, in August of 2021, Woo! but, but that's not saying that you, that's not saying that I was dealing with issues yeah. for the, those whole six years. I had a, some, like, it only, it really, the initial, um, like process only took a few months. 
to kind of get back. Um, so I was really lucky with that because I didn't have any scar tissue. I didn't have any like nerve damage. I didn't have any of that stuff. So I got, I really lucked out in the, on that front. And then I went straight from like my first, pretty much my first couple weeks back on the horn, I was at a music festival and I was with people, with teachers that had gone through injuries before. And there's a lot of conflicting information about how to go through an injury because everyone goes through an injury differently. So I just had a lot of information and I kind of had to build and take some of that information and build what worked for me. But what worked for me was just going really slowly and doing very simple things. Um, and doing things that were like musical right from the very beginning, you know? So it's like Clark studies and then little duet songs were the things that helped me the most. But this most recent surgery that I had, I had a, I didn't have any issues until like January of, or jo- sorry, not January, like July of 2021 since that initial like first couple weeks or first oh, couple that's months. Good. I mean. So you were, yeah. you were saying that uh, because of this experience, you were, you were, I guess, in a situation where you needed to reflect on your habits. So what, mm-hmm. what did you, what did you learn about yourself and your trumpet playing? I learned that I was playing with a lot of tension. Um, I remember my first, my very, very first note back on the instrument. I, cause like all of my, my, even, even my face shape changed like people had asked me they're like did you lose weight because i had these like big muscles i feel like in the back of my face and it made my face a little bit more square um so like my entire like shape of my face changed from not playing trumpet for the for like two months and um like i remember my first notes back on the instrument because all my muscle tone was gone um i remember being like wow this is what it's like to not play with any tension like i had no um, like I didn't feel like I was fighting the horn. I just was able to like blow into the instrument and, and sound would come out. Um, so, I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a great sound. It was like a really flat C <laughs> that was my first note. Cause that's the thing when you first go back to something, usually your things are pretty flat sounding. And I don't know, I, I, I was told like, don't get focused on, so focused on tuning just yet, just kind of tuning comes, that's one of the last things that kind of comes in when you're going through an injury. But I remember that being so striking to me is like, oh, wow, like this is noticed so flat. Um, I, but yeah, that I was wanna, the, really the first time that I learned how much tension I was playing with. And I think you, you make a good point too. Um, when a beginner plays the horn, I think it should be the sim- a similar way. In the beginning, you don't even know what's in tune when you're first mm-hmm. starting out. So you just want a steady sound, your best yeah. steady sound. That's what I think. Um, do you agree or disagree? You, you can disagree if you want. Yeah, I just kind of, I focus most on just seeing if they can match pitch. Yeah. So we do, when I start with beginners, I do a lot of singing um yeah. because that's i think that's the hardest part is they don't have a reference frame for mm-hmm. what something sounds like so and that's why they struggle with what to practice at home because they they'll hear this the c if you're playing a c they'll hear the c when you're playing it when they're playing it with you but then when they go home they're like what was that note they can't right. hear it anymore um so i don't really focus on on tuning too much with beginners i just focus on kind of recalling pitch that's good. And singing. We'll pause right here for the ambulance. So what were the next steps after you were just playing a sound? How how did what was your approach after that? The next step, so at that music festival, I was told to uh switch to a bigger mouthpiece. And I'm not a gear person. I've kind of used the same stuff. I have a I have acquired a lot of mouthpieces somehow just over the time of playing trumpet, but I use one. And I use one trumpet usually for most things um so i had always played on a 3c and um this one teacher who i was getting a lesson with said oh while you're going through your injury it might feel more comfortable to you to switch to a larger mouthpiece so i tried a few and the one that worked best for me was a one and a quarter bach regular bach mouthpiece and um so i played on that pretty much my whole time coming back and that actually really did help i'm not really sure why i have 
I have no idea why that felt comfortable to me. But I've noticed talking to other people with injuries that that's something that they have also said is kind of switching to bigger equipment for a little bit has helped them kind of get things back. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure why that works, but, um, but yeah, so I was kind of just doing the same things of playing little songs, playing little duets, resting, just like you would play maybe like a minute and then you would rest and play another minute and then you would rest and just kind of did that for as long as I could and then expanding the time out further so I could play longer and longer. Um, but I, I mean, like I said, I got really lucky. I, everything kind of came back pretty really pretty smoothly for me which i know isn't the case for a lot of people well did your playing change at all before and after the accident or do you feel like you came back the same player oh no definitely not i think my sound i actually my playing got better and i don't think without that injury that i would have noticed how dysfunctional my playing was um because i was able to play and sound good but I didn't realize like on my end how much effort I was putting in to have to play um, and play and make a really good sound. So I think, um, I don't know. I saw this video one time where I'll do it really quick. Um, so you put your hands together like this and you can put them together or you can push them together, right? And on the outside, it doesn't look any different, right? Mm. But one, when you're pushing your hands together, that puts mm. out a lot more effort than when you're just kind of putting your hands together. One position mm. you can hold all day, and one, your hands are going to get tired after pushing them together for a while, right? Yeah, for sure. So I feel like I was playing like this for a long time. So the result was the same, but I was putting out a lot more effort to get the same result. Uh, and I think that's what was changing the most in my playing. So, so and, and my sound did get better because <laughs> when you don't play better. with, yeah, when you don't play f with tension, it it sounds better. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, if you remember, where was your tension? Where did you hold tension in your body? Oh, in my neck, definitely in my neck. Like I used, there would be some things I remember in college that I would play, and it would almost feel like I had a sore throat after after playing because I just had so much, I think I was trying to put too much air through the horn and it was catching here. Um, Cause your lips are pretty, pretty delicate. They can't hold back a ton, a ton of air. So it's gotta build up, it'll build up somewhere else. For sure. And hearing you say that, I wanna ask the question, uh, I guess, what were the limits on your range? Like, what, what was that for you? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I've never been a super, high note lead player ever um but i was really good at piccolo trumpet like early on and i think it was because of how tight my setup was um so i didn't have a super high range i i mean i could play up to like a, a d above a high c which is about where i'm comfortable playing now okay. um i can probably get up to like an e flat now but I don't know. I've just never been like, it's not something that I practice often. Yeah. <laughs> so that's probably why. And D, never D's been and really e flats, developed. you know, that's, I think that's plenty if you're not a lead player. Yeah, yeah. It's in the range. It was, I was able to do everything that I needed to do mm -hmm. with what I was doing. Yeah. So any, anything in classical trumpet land minus like a Brandenburg concerto, I could do, mm -hmm. you know, cause I, I still can't play that. <laughs> oh yeah. I understand. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, what? How was your endurance? How would you uh, describe your endurance before and after in comparison? Yeah. Um, I think when you get out of the way of your own playing, that you're able to just play. It, it doesn't feel like you're. It almost doesn't feel like you're exerting any effort. So you can play for a lot longer. Um, which I was something that I didn't really. I, I didn't really notice that because I, I, I've been lucky in that regard where I haven't really had a ton of issues with endurance. Um, so, but I do think it was better after I came back um, just because I was putting less effort forth into the instrument. So I didn't have, I wasn't as, I wasn't as tired as quickly, I would say. Um, and even now, even now with my playing, it's like, 
even if I have a hard day where I play like two show a two show day, like my lips feel pretty good the next day. Um, but doing that like multiple days in a row, I mean, that's just your body is going to get tired. You know, if you're not recovering well, it's so I think it's I think endurance has a lot more to do with what you do outside of the horn than for than sure with, with actual trumpet. Hey, I want to interrupt the interview just to invite you to download my brand new book called Master Endurance on Trumpet. This book will teach you the three reliable ways to truly build endurance on trumpet. The link to the book is in the description below. Go ahead and get yours now. It's free. It's a gift from me to you. Now back to the interview. For sure. So you just kind of touched on a couple of things um, that I like to talk about in general. Um, you said that you said that the endurance has more to do with your body than it does the trumpet, mm -hmm. which every chance I get, my students hear me say my body is the primary instrument because I yeah. that's true. The music that you make is coming from inside of you out of the bell. So um, I always like to um, try to correct problems with the body first. And, you know, you hear mm -hmm. that in the bell. And uh well, what do you think about that first? And then I'll tell you the other thought that I had. Yeah, I think that's abs I think that's absolutely right. Um, if your body isn't functioning, like if you're not feeding yourself well, if you're not like I used to go to rehearsals and I will have eaten like maybe a bagel in the morning and then drank coffee the entire day. And then my rehearsal would, would be at like 1 p.m. And I'd be like, why are my hands shaky? Or like, why do I feel like so on edge you know and it's like oh just because you didn't eat anything all day and you're running on caffeine so I, I don't know like i go to rehearsals now i have snacks before the rehearsal i have snacks in the car i eat in a full meal usually if i can fit it in before if i have a rehearsal or a performance just because i know that that affects my body personally some people's maybe blood sugars are a little bit more stable but like i know for me like if I go into a stressful situation with no fuel in my body, it's like a recipe for disaster. Like I'm going to just it, my anxiety ramps up too, which is kind of strange. But like if you look up, if you if you know, like the symptoms of low blood sugar, like it mimics anxiety, you know, and if you're already anxious because of your performance that you're doing or whatever, like it's just going to ramp. It's just going to add on top of it. So like making sure you get enough sleep, which is really hard especially if you're doing like a musical or a show you know you, your show ends at 10 30 and you don't get home till 11 or 11 30 and then you have to teach at 8 a.m you know that's not giving your body a ton of time to recover you know so just resting and getting enough sleep where you can and um yeah i don't know like your body is your inch like you're, you said your body is your instrument so yeah, and it, sure. it does come across in your sound you know oh, if you yes. think back if you if you have a bad playing day it's always helpful to like look back at what you did earlier that day because maybe it's like oh yeah i got four hours of sleep the night before and then i woke up and then i had a fight with my best friend you know and then you're trying to to come into a situation a high stress situation where you need complete focus and then play your best after you just um like you're running on low fuel and then you had like something emotionally um sh like stressful going on that's that's hard <laughs> yeah it is for sure yeah you kind of touched on something um that I, I always enjoy talking about and you and i had this conversation uh in private so i want to talk about it in the public but you, you kind of just touched on it but it's the effects of, of a routine on on your performance so um i'm somebody who really plays with the routine um like if i have anything weird happen i'm kind of thinking what did i do differently <laughs> what did i do differently today before i got to the bandstand so i like yeah. i like to play with those things and so um some pointers that i always like to give people that because they've worked for me is just drink a ton of water drink a ton of water that will allow your uh, lips to vibrate the best and um mm -hmm. i like to play with my sleep uh just to just to learn how much sleep do i actually need 
You know, I know some people can yeah. operate on four. I don't know how, but no, you know, yeah, <laughs> I can't do that. But, uh, you know, just to find your number, whatever <laughs> it is for you and try to get that much sleep so you can play your best. And then yeah. what about your meals? Like timing out your meals um, mm. so that your body can perform its best. Um those are things that I play with. And none of those things have anything really to do with trumpet. But, of course, you'll play better if you give your body what it needs. So yeah. um, those are some things I like to talk about. Uh, what, are some, what are some routines that work for you? Um, I'm just now kind of starting to build routines for myself that I like and that are actually working. I've always really struggled with sleep because I'm a, I'm a musician, I'm a night owl, and I feel more productive at night versus during the day. And I know that's true for a lot of musicians, but what I do now, so I'm the executive director of a nonprofit music ensemble here in the city, and that staying up all night really late, getting stuff done, isn't really helpful for my day job. So I've had to kind of switch up my sleeping schedule a little bit. And it's it's hard, especially if you're you are if especially if I am taking gigs and then I'm trying to wake up and be at my computer at 9 a.m. And like having had breakfast before then and having had a little bit of time to myself in the morning um, after doing like a musical that night and then getting home at like 11 or midnight you know, and then making sure and then like trying to get a full eight hours of sleep in. It's it's tricky, like the balance is tricky. And I think musicians always struggle with balance. And so I I don't know, I don't really have a ton of routines for me because it changes every day. And I used to get really upset and and down on I'd build these routines and then I'd be like, OK, 8 a.m. I'm going to do this. 9 a.m. I'm going to do this. 10 a.m. I'm going to do this. And then <laughs> And then it'd be like 10 o'clock and I would already be off track. And then I'd be like, well, today is just shot. And then I would be talking to like, I'm really t tight with my dad. So we talk on the phone and he'd be like, what'd you do today? And I'm like, oh, I did this and I did this and I did this. And I'd list off like eight or 10 things. And I'm like, but I didn't do my routine. So and he's like, yeah, but you got all this other stuff done. So, <laughs> so I just realized that for me, I just make myself a list of like a few things that I need to get done and I don't put a timeline on them. I'm like, just sometime in the day of today, these need to get done. And then that seems to work for me. Um, so I don't know. I just, I eat breakfast every morning. That's something that I do. That is a routine that I do. Um, and then I take 20 minutes in the morning after I eat breakfast to drink coffee and read a book. And then that's, and then I start my day. And I feel like if I don't get to do those things, then um, like my body isn't fueled for the day. And then I'm not like decompressed or calm to start my day, you know, cause I like having a few minutes of time to myself. So I'm still working on the sleep piece. I've never been able to be like, Oh, nine o'clock, gotta go to bed. Like that's, it's just really difficult for me. So that's kind of something that I'm working on right now. But I, I read something that, that really resonates with me as far as like thinking about stress um, and it said that stress is not like a work project or a gig or something mm -hmm. like that. Stress is how your body responds to life. So if your body isn't resilient for whatever reason or it's not responding the way that you want it to, there's like something that's happening where your needs aren't being met because that's when stress happens is like when you're trying to do a lot of things and your body isn't recovering from it. And that's when the stress kind of like builds up, you know? So it's just how your body is responding to certain situations. And that's really what the stress actually is. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Good tips, good pointers. And I like that because people can um, hear your, what works for you, what works for me. And I know they're probably somewhere in between. So that's mm -hmm. really good. You talked about something earlier. I want to return to that. You bring up so many good points. <laughs> um, but you were talking about, you gave us the illustration of putting your hands together and how uh, both hands, how, how this 
I'm pushing right now looks like this when I'm not pushing and how mm. one is just easier. And um, I know people approach the trumpet that way. I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. And um, I just, again, want to point out just how much uh, like life that actually is. You know, I remember mm-hmm. learning this lesson for the first time when I was younger in high school. And maybe you can relate, but it's like, man, I, I want a girlfriend. And you like try to get a girlfriend <laughs> and like nothing works. And you're like, ah, forget it. Then all of a sudden, mm-hmm. somebody seems interested in you, you know. Isn't yeah. that how, <laughs> isn't that how it works? <laughs> you know. Well, that's that's what they always say. It's like things come along when you're not looking, you know. Yeah. So, um, I just wanted to talk about that because I think trumpet playing. I don't know the best way to describe it, but it, you know, it's it's it'll teach you about life if you allow it to. Mm-hmm. So one thing that people always ask about, you can search it on YouTube, how to play high notes <laughs> or yeah. um, fill in the blank, any any technique you want to talk about. Um, I've learned that when you don't try as hard, the mm-hmm. things come out freely and, and flow. So so what's your experience with, you know, you had you had like this very clear uh cut which was your injury where you basically were forced to change your approach to the horn and so um you know what are your thoughts on i guess doing things with less effort yeah i mean i'm not a super patient person so okay. that's probably why I like the development of routines or like i even remember in college like my teacher being like just do this just try this for a week and see how it goes I'd be like a week i don't have a week <laughs> right, you know right right <laughs> So yeah. like, I've always been like, how can I do this with like the, in the quickest way with like, I, and I always, I am, I always think about that for everything, you know, like mm-hmm. what's the quickest way that I can get this done, you know? And I think most people are like that because that's how our society is, you know, we're always trying to like, what's the quickest way to do this so that I can have more time to do whatever else that you're trying to do, you know? Mm-hmm. So I am. <laughs> I don't know. I think like I'll have students that will come into their lessons and they'll be like, I need to play this this note by tomorrow. And I'll be like, well, that's not going to happen today. <laughs> and let me tell you why. And it's OK that it's not mm-hmm. going to happen today. And so there are certain things and that used to really bother me as a teacher that, oh, my gosh, I can't teach this kid how to play um like an f on the top of the staff by the end of the lesson you know right and then i started to look at it a little bit deeper where i'm like this isn't necessarily my my fault as a teacher it's like this teacher this maybe it's it's like the band teacher is programming stuff that's too hard for their band you know Mm -hmm. and or they are not this is something that i saw with with band teachers in particular is coming out of covid They didn't really realize like, hey, your kids aren't going to be at the same level that they were when they before COVID, you Mm -hmm. know, it's not like the progression of, okay, so my seventh graders play this, my eighth graders play this, my ninth graders play this. I saw some some band teachers, not all, some band teachers were, were really good about this, but, you know, some teachers are, they use the same curriculum every year, depending on where that 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 band is you know so it's like i said like the seventh graders play this eighth graders play this blah 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 and i think some teachers were trying to do that after covid and their kids didn't have a year of band you know so it's like okay maybe your eighth graders need to be playing the stuff that your seventh graders are playing and maybe your or maybe even maybe you need to go back and do some other stuff because and i saw that in my students because they were like I need to play this and i'm like oh cool you hadn't you didn't have a year of band and you had a year of online lessons you know yes and we're trying to now play an f on the top of the staff and it's like and we've only been working on like up to c like i can't raise your range that much in one lesson you know right and so i tell the students i'm like this isn't because you can't do it it's just because like we're so we have to manage expectations a little bit in lessons and we have to explain it a little bit of like this isn't your fault you can play it just not right now and 
we can try it. And I always see if we can try it and I give a kid, I'll do an exercises with them and I'll give them three chances to try up to that note with through like a Clark study or like we go up that way gradually. And then if they can't do it, like after three tries, I'm like, okay, we're stopping there for the day because that we that was something that I learned when I was going through my injury too is like I would go as high as I could with like Clark studies or something. And then if there was one, if I hit a wall, like if I was playing like, I don't know, like Clark won that um, chromatic exercise or whatever, and I couldn't get the top note. I'd try it three times. And then if I couldn't get it, then I'd stop there for the day and be like, okay. And I just kind of make a little note and be like, okay, I got up to a D in the staff today. And that was the highest that I could get. And then you would see if I, cause I was writing that stuff down, um, not super officially tracking it, um, but just kind of informally writing it down. And then you could kind of see like it would get better but yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I like the, uh, three strikes and out rule. <laughs> and a lot of people, yeah. uh, have written about that in their book. Like, um, I know Caruso has for sure. I've read it in, in multiple books where they tell you after three attempts, stop. Why is that rule yeah. in place? So that you don't practice bad habits. Mm -hmm. So that's really what that's all about. So something that really stands out to my ear, when I first heard you play, I was at the uh, racetrack. You were the bugler <laughs> for uh, the races, the horse races. And mm -hmm. I, um, that was my first time ever experiencing that. And I wish you could have seen me because, you know, it was a hot summer day. I think it was a Sunday and we just came from church and I was, I think we changed clothes Anyway, I was I was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we were in the sun, and I looked around, and you know, women had hats with long bibs to you know protect themselves from the heat, and I was just out there, man. I was just exposed. <laughs> I wasn't all that happy about it, um, but I was trying to have fun, trying to enjoy myself, and so I was I was with um, uh, family, and the trumpet sounded. And I shushed everybody. Shut, shh, be quiet. You hear that trumpet? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I was like really listening. And I was like, man, that trumpet player can play. Like for real. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was, I was really like listening to the bugle call. And I was thinking like, man, I can't do that. Not like that. That's what I was thinking. That's some real crisp <laughs> articulation. So, <laughs> yeah, I was totally nerding out at the at the racetrack. So, um, you know, we watched the race and, um, you know, horses did that thing. Everybody placed their bets. And um, I think it was my sister-in-law. She said, hey, Chris, the trumpet player is back there. And I said, what? And I turned around and I went straight to you. And that's when we officially met. So yeah. I'll, I'll remember that. That was that was pretty um it ended up being fun for me because you you played that bugle call. <laughs> so, <laughs> like at your, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, my yep. glass is fogging up now. So, um, <laughs> all of that to say, like to my ear, from the first time I heard you, your articulations really uh, stood out to to my ear. And now that we're talking, you may have uh, already had that injury. Is that true? Did you ever have a I think season? it was. Yeah, I think it was after that. Wow, that was that's after amazing. So yeah. um real basic question, uh where did you get your concept of articulation one? And secondly, how did you go about practicing it? I th okay, okay. <laughs> this is going to sound uh I don't recommend this, okay. I would say. <laughs> so, I was taught how to like I was introduced to multiple tonguing pretty early on, I would say like maybe in like seventh or eighth grade. I don't know. I don't know when people introduce multiple tonguing for students because um, I do it based on just different things, like based on the student. I do it based on the student. So some people are you learn it earlier. Some kids learn it earlier than others. If I'm starting a beginner, I try and introduce it a little bit earlier on. Um, but like for high school kids and kids that I am 
like if they need to know it, then I teach it to them, which probably isn't the best way to, to do things like this. But um, so I was introduced to it early on and I thought I was doing it. I thought I was multiple tonguing and I just wasn't. So I developed this like crazy fast single tongue. So the call to post, I single tongue that. I single tongue the whole thing. And that's and amazing. I also don't <laughs> I also don't there's like a a traditional way to play it where it's a triplet and I could never do it, so I just didn't. So it sounds it's actually the way that the fanfare that I would play isn't the technically what's actually written. But people play it with doubles and people play with triples you'll hear it both ways so and but if you see the actual like written out i think there's like some official like uh, bugle call book somewhere from like the army or, or something like that i don't know there's like an official like re it's really old it's a really old book and i've only ever seen uh pictures of it online but it's actually a triplet um in that little fanfare and i would never do a triplet i would just do a double um, so go listen to some trumpet calls and you'll see what I'm talking about. But yeah, so I, I, and I still to this day can mo single tongue most things. Um, so my multiple tonguing, that's, that's like a, uh, I would say like a sore spot or a soft spot in my playing is multiple tonguing. Um, that's all good. So, <laughs> so how, cause I, I recently developed my multiple tonguing in recent years, um, but we could talk about that in a minute. So you got a really yeah. good single tongue. A lot of people that I come across in real in real life, <laughs> they tell me the same thing. Um, yeah. Because that's really most people don't need to do the multiple tonguing. Um, a professional, uh, I guess there's some scenarios where a professional would, but um, but how did you develop that single tongue so fast? Yeah, I think it's um, so my very first trumpet teacher, we would always end with um, with a duet at the end of our lessons. And uh, one that I really liked was Bolero out of the back of the Arben book. And like that one. And so he would start it really slow. And then by the time that I was finishing studying with him and he moved me on to a different teacher, we were going like blazing fast on that duet. So, I mean, I think I just would practice that a lot because I liked it and I thought it was fun and I just wanted to see I kind of it was a like in my brain I wanted to see how fast we could play it before my teacher would mess up so <laughs> I think I was just I just practiced it because I wanted to see how fast we could play it and um so I think I just learned it from there and then it's it is kind of hard if you don't know what you're listening for whether a student is, is actually multiple tonguing or if they're just single tonguing and I just think that it was I, I was able to no one ever caught it you know like no one ever caught that it wasn't double double tongued or triple tongued or whatever mm -hmm. and um I didn't I didn't really know that I wasn't multiple tonguing until like my freshman year of college and I was like oh and then I hit some stuff where I'm like I can't single tongue this and then I had to learn how to double tongue or triple tongue you know mm -hmm. and at that point you kind of know how to practice a skill and you can kind of get it but it's still not something that I'm like like if I can get around it I usually try to because yeah. it's just I don't know I still have this like block with mental, multiple tonguing. Mental. Yeah. yeah so but even um, in that hello dolly book where it's like dig it again dig it again dig it again dig it again like i had to multiple tongue that and it still wasn't as clean as i would have wanted it to be but yeah i i practice multiple tonguing like within the the music that i'm learning it in mm -hmm. usually because yeah, i understand I and that's really only like possible <laughs> yeah i understand so i want to share another story for for you but really for the for the viewer and the listener so um i got by so so far with just single tonguing and uh, i got a call to play um carnival of venice and oh, yeah. i said in my head i'm like i don't have that multiple tonguing together and then there was another voice that said take the job anyway and learn how to multiple <laughs> tongue <laughs> so yeah. so man i was like so nervous inside before i answered and um I said, well, actually, I, I, I'm not really that good at multiple tonguing. I, I can't play the piece. And the voice on the other sit, on the other end of the phone said, well, can't you learn? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose I can. <laughs> so, 
Yeah. So I took the job and then I hung up the phone and I said, I need a teacher right now. <laughs> so I'm like, who can help me with this? And I was I was actually kind of in a, in, in a little bit of a panic. And um, and so I got on. I had just talked to Ingrid Jensen. Uh, this okay. is when Behind the No podcast was uh, I was still making new episodes. And she sure. made a statement in passing. She said, well, today you can learn from anybody because of the Internet. So I'm thinking, like, who can I reach out to? And I, I reached out to Adam Rapper. And so he introduced okay. this whole concept to me, which is in the Clark book. Goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> about um, anchor tonguing. And mm. <clears throat> so I'm like, I wasn't anchor tonguing, Monica. So I was okay. I was tonguing with the tip of my tongue at the top of my mouth, not anchored at the bottom. And it's I guess the official name of the tonguing method is K modified tonguing. So I wasn't anchor tonguing and I'm the kind of student that I would do whatever my teacher tells me to do. It doesn't matter if I disagree with it or not, because I want to learn their perspective. And the only way to learn their perspective is to do what they're telling you to do. So mm-hmm. I totally abandoned the old technique I was using. And sure. of course, there's that learning curve where nothing is working, you know. Sure. It, it's a new concept. It wasn't working well for me. And I still had jobs to do. And so I was going out in public and um, that K modifier wasn't working and two, three weeks in, neither was the old way. I'm like, oh, man, I really suck now. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to myself, I might as well just commit to the new way. So, you know, if I'm honest, it took me well over a year to get that K-modified down. And there there were um, there was progress, but it came slowly. And like so far apart, it was about, I don't know, two, three months where I where I finally began to see a little bit of progress, you sure. know? So, um, I say that. So whoever is listening to this, be encouraged when you're learning a new technique, go ahead and, um, just know you'll reach the goal of just stay patient and keep working it out slowly. So, yeah, um, yeah that's my yeah, experience I just, with that. I think I don't like practicing multiple tonguing because all of the, oops, sorry. I think I'm kind of far away. Um, all of the exercises for multiple tonguing are so boring. Mm-hmm. Like it's just a page of the same note or like like basically up a scale. And it's the yeah. same rhythm, it's yeah. the same stuff, and it's so boring. And so I was trying to figure out a way that I could make this more fun for myself and that I would actually do it. And because I was at a point one time with multiple tonguing where I couldn't do multiple tonguing without thinking of the syllables. Like mm-hmm. tuku, 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 tuku. or like I, I had to think of the syllables or else my body like wouldn't do it and would just slip back into single tonguing or it would just get fumbled up. So I started doing um, I would just pick a pop song and whatever the tempo was, whatever the key was, and I would just multiple tongue over that. So it was like I was kind of trying to teach my body how to like sorry, another siren. It's all right. Um, I was trying to kind of teach my body how to not be reliant on those syllables and to just kind of like slip into like that muscle memory. Yes. So I almost I wanted to do it where my conscious brain wasn't really activated and it was just kind yes. of going. So so I would do that. I would do that. And I still do that sometimes when I really, really need to work on something that is a skill that I don't like, don't like practicing. Mm-hmm. I'll try and find just the simplest way because if I, if my brain gets involved with some of those things if it's more of a physical um skill that i'm working on the minute my brain gets involved it just gets more complicated yeah so i don't know so That's i still good. do that to the pop songs because i like pop music and i don't know i don't always like the music that i have to do stuff for multiple tonguing yes. so that's good to learn things through songs that's probably the best way to learn and uh, I think about September uh, by Earth, Wind and Fire, because mm-hmm. especially at the time where I switched over from the technique t- to uh, K-Modify, I was playing that in um, a jobbing band every every weekend. 
and I noticed when I when I really got comfortable with K modified, oh, it was so much easier to play those those lines. So, and then my I'm range sure. got better as well. So anyway, we talk oh, about yeah. that. I had so many so many more questions I wanted to ask you, but um, I'm I'm not I'm going to wait. We can have you back <laughs> later if you like to come back. Um, okay. But I have some questions here that came from uh, the viewers. And sure. I just wanted to read these out to you and, and uh, you let me know mm-hmm. what you think. Sure. Um, the concept here is expanding your range. Um, okay. That's what these questions are referring to. Sure. Um, but I don't, I'm not necessarily thinking about extending the range for. When I hear the phrase extended range, I'm thinking about anybody. I'm thinking about a beginner. I'm thinking about intermediate player. I'm thinking about a professional. Whatever the top of your range is mm-hmm. right now, I'm thinking about expanding it where you are. So um, okay, that's the context. What's most interesting to me is that the partials are so much closer the higher you go. So how is it that at some point the air gets choked off? You were talking about that earlier. Mm. It almost feels in my head. I, I wonder if they it means psychological. If I can play, yeah, I think so. Because they say, if I can play an E flat above the staff, then why not F? Why can't mm-hmm. I play G? It's, they're so close. It seems yeah. counterintuitive. Yep. So what do you think about that? So this is one of those things. Range is also one of those things where I think, and I see it with students all the time. Um, this is also one of those things where where I was talking about with the multiple tonguing, where if your brain gets involved, it just makes things a little bit harder. So because I think range is more of like your brain obviously has to be involved <laughs> when you're doing these things, but the music sheet music doesn't necessarily have to be involved. And I think that's where we kind of get in our heads with it a little bit because, so I'll just give you an example. So I'll play an exercise with a student and you, I don't have any, I do have written warmups for them, but when we play it in lessons, we don't use any music for warmups. Um, and so I'll be like, okay. And so I'll play something and then they'll play it back to me. Then I'll play something. They'll play it back to me and we do it like that. And then we'll pull up their band music and they'll be like, oh, I can't hit that note. And I'm like, you remember that exercise that we just did in warmups? You have played like five of those notes in this lesson, you know? So I think when we see music, especially like really high notes written out, we're like, oh, it's that note. And especially if you know the edge of your range where it's like, I play to this note, then I think that's where that mental block happens. Um, So something that I've been told is like taking little lines of music or something like a little song or something and just transposing it higher and higher and higher and higher. And your brain doesn't really need to know what note you're on. Um, so it's a way to kind of trick your body and your brain into learning high range without having to look at music or an exercise or something like that. Like, I think music is sheet music is good, but I think we've become so reliant on it that we're not listening to our body and we're not really listening to what we're playing. So I think that's a good way to kind of not like, yeah, not trick your body, but like learn without having we're just so analytical you know and i think that's just because of how a trumpet has been taught for so long and it's like you need a couple method books and there's so much music in the world you know like you could take like i don't know like a dua lipa song and <laughs> just learn the melody of that pop song and then just transpose it up a bunch of steps and before you know it you'll be like playing in the high range yeah you know? for sure Hey, but you... it takes time too. That's the other thing. It takes time, like what we were saying. Yeah. And not a lot of people are willing to take the time to develop that range. Yeah, for sure. Um, a question that I get often is, "How long is this going to take?" <laughs> we kind of talked about that earlier. But um, yeah. Uh, will you talk about the the earlier part of the question where they were talking about the air getting choked off? You were you were saying mm-hmm. you experienced that. So, how how did you get over that feeling? Yeah, I think I just was using too much air. I mean, I come from like we come from the 
Chicago brass sound world where it's super big and bombastic and really loud all the time, you know, but at a certain point, like physiologically, your body can only exhale so much air, you know, um, and your lips can only hold back a certain amount of air, you know? So if you're trying to put a lot of air through the horn to get those upper notes, it's going to be backed up somewhere, you know? So like maybe trying less air, smaller equipment. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like you have to use the equipment that's going to be good for what you're doing, you know? So yeah. if you're trying to play on like a, this is just my, some people do this. This is just my personal opinion. Um, if you're using like massive, like one C mouthpiece and you're trying to play these super high notes, some people do this and that's, that's what they, they work on and they always have. But like, if you're trying to do that, like you're going to be putting, like you're doing this again, right. Or you're putting more effort in because you're not using the equipment that's going to make things easier, you know? So yeah. So that's that's my one thing where like yeah equipment can be helpful if you're playing in the extreme upper register i think okay. so the next question is uh they said my challenge is vibration of my lips and <laughs> uh the question the actual question is how can i increase range without the use of excess of pressure on the lips I'm not sure what I, I just think my my question would be like why do they feel like their lips need to vibrate? Okay. You know? Okay. Um and this isn't this isn't my pedagogy and I don't really know how much I can like speak to this. Um but physiologically I would suggest them I would suggest for them to look at how the trumpet is actually being being played from a physics standpoint. Um and I can't I can't really go into like the, I, I don't know, like the, like what I know, because what I have learned from somebody, from a teacher, like it's, it's a little bit of like protected information. I don't really know how much I can share, but like, I would suggest them to go down like a rabbit hole about physics of trumpet playing, because I think that will kind of help inform the need to feel like your lips are vibrating. Yeah, I mean, I would just go back to the same kind of thing of like, are you using the right equipment? Like just mess if you have the ability to mess around with some some mouthpieces, try it and see, you know, because it could be just a mouth. And I, I was never a proponent of like, oh, switch your mouthpiece, you know, but sometimes with that extreme upper register stuff, like it could very possibly be like a mouthpiece change could be the, the difference, you know, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. And yeah, just teaching your body without music, yeah. because I think we we do these things where um, like we preset for things if we see that they're high. You know, it's almost like yeah. your body's like bracing, you know, like if you have like a little brother and he like goes uh, and it's yeah, going to like good point. punch you in the arm and yeah. you go and you like you kind of yeah. brace for it, you know, yeah, that's kind of what we do when we see like those upper notes, right? We kind of go, that's high. Yeah. And then we clamp down and we do all this weird stuff. So if you can trick your body into playing those upper notes without your brain knowing it, like, I think that's the way to go. Like finding those like, um, more unconventional ways to, to play in those, in those ranges without music. So when you mentioned the physics of trumpet playing, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, and there's a video online that I'll link to here. Uh, the yeah. professor uh, put, he used fire to illustrate how molecules will move and create sound in the trumpet. He used fire, he used a, like a blowtorch or something. And uh, I don't know if it, what the material was. It, it looked like it was a plastic tube, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll link to that video if I can find it and put it here under this video. And yeah, that's that a great video. <laughs> yeah, to get you thinking a little differently about how much energy you actually need to use to play the horn. Um, yeah. But with the lips, though, um, I'm telling people the lips, the lips do this in the in the cup, like they move, like they're not perfectly still because we're blowing wind. 
But that's not something you have to think about. That's mm-hmm. you don't have you just think about breathing in and blowing out. And that and yeah. that vibration will take care of itself. Um mm-hmm. I don't know where the, where the vibration happens cuz all vibration is created, all sound is created through vibration. So I don't know if it's happening I don't know what the point is. I don't know if it's here. I don't know if it's in the lead pipe. It might be both. I don't know. But I, I just tell students yeah. when like cuz I think there's a lot of focus on the lips from just band pedagogy Mm because almost everyone is like buzzing and you have to set your lips like this and blah 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 and like you roll your bottom lip in to go higher and roll it out when you go i've heard like some weird stuff as far as like pedagogy with just like lips you know so i just tell my students i say your lips act like a bridge to get the air from your body into the trumpet and that's their job Mm. um And then there will be things that happen naturally, right? When you go higher, things will change with your lips. When you go lower, things will change with your lips. But it's, I don't want them to actively be thinking about that stuff because they will do it. They'll think too much on it. And then their attention is going there. And then it's like, oh, well, I played that high note, but I didn't roll my bottom lip in or I didn't do this. And it's like, yeah, but you still played the note. So I just want them to think of the lips as like a bridge to get the air from the instrument or from the body to the instrument. And that there's, there are other places that you can place your focus that will be more helpful. I would say. Ah, uh, that's good. I like that bridge analogy. That's very good. Uh, I got one more for you. This one's kind of wordy. I might have to paraphrase it, but they said sure. they're a comeback player. They didn't play for 25 years. And they started practicing again over the last three months. So they get a raspy sound when they play. Like okay. I'm, I'm imagining like that, probably like that split tone. Um, yeah, because I get the word, his words exactly. I get a raspy, I think it's a typo. I get a raspy between the notes tone frequently. Mm-hmm. That's got to be a typo, but I think I know what he means. <laughs> Even on low notes. So there's that. So let's talk let's talk to that part first. If someone has that split tone or a raspy tone, uh what might be happening there? What do they need to adjust? Just from hearing this and not knowing the player, not knowing their instrument, you know, because it could very well be if your instrument was sitting around for 25 years, there could be something wrong with your instrument if you had, if haven't had it serviced in a while, you know. Um, but just hearing this, this is an exercise that I, I think you're using, I think they probably may, might be using too much air and their lips are too close together, but that's just me. So, but I, I don't actually know <laughs> again. Mm-hmm. So this is an exercise that I learned in Suzuki trumpet training. And so, uh, you take your pinky and you put it between your teeth like that. And then I tell my students to hug use their lips to hug the pinky like this and then you remove your pinky and that kind of reminds your body to hold space for the air column to come out between your lips because a lot of times our lips are too close together and you get kind of that sound and then you're doing this again yes right and so i think it's a combination of using too much air and then having the lips be too close together so this exercise just kind of reminds you to keep space between your lips so i would do that and then that exercise and then i would just go to the mouthpiece and just see if you can notice the space between your lips if you're holding space and you're not buzzing you're just exhaling air into the mouthpiece focusing on seeing if you can are holding that space Mm -hmm. between your lips and then if you do it and then you go to the trumpet i would just exhale through this that same shape into the trumpet and then see like how little effort how much more little effort you can put to making a sound i thought that doesn't make any sense you want to make a sound what you need to you yeah, want to like make what a sound else? with the less uh, energy as possible. Yeah, like I think if you're holding that shape, you'll notice like 
as you're blo as you're exhaling into the horn, you might just have a sound pop out naturally, you know, like it might yeah. just come out. Like I've had students do that and they're like, I'll be like, blow air or sorry, exhale air into your trumpet and it'll just have a sound, you know? So because the air is has an has an exit, you know, it can come out of your lips and into the trumpet, you know, yes. whereas before you, it was kind of having to push through that like wall of lip, you know? Yes, yes. And so like usually when you go, when you do that exercise and then you go to the trumpet, the sound will kind of just come out because it doesn't have to fight against anything anymore. Ah, uh, very good. So that's what I'm thinking is going on. But yeah, get, get your horn serviced and make sure that there's no, nothing weird happening. Yeah, just sitting um, for that long could <laughs> allow for trouble to happen. That's true. Yeah, it could have like yeah. corks missing or something. And I don't know. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, well, you know, I want to say thank you for doing this with us. We're thankful to have you today. Thanks for giving us yeah. your time and your expertise. Of course. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for watching the interview all the way till the end. If you watched it straight through or if you watched it in pieces, either way, thank you. Remember, you can get your free book, Master Endurance on Trumpet. Learn how to build endurance on the horn by reading this book. The link is in the description. Besides that, go ahead, click the next video on the screen and continue your education. I'll see you there to help you out. Take care. God bless.